Hello, my name is Baby Doc, and this is part one of the Never a DJ podcast, where I'll be interviewing. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Never a DJ. My name's Baby Doc, and this is Never a DJ. Join me while I speak to the innovators and originators of the clubbing world, talking past, present, and future. Today, I'm talking with Mike Van Dyke, the techno pioneer, DJ, and producer, and half of the classic outfit, Marmion. Never a DJ. <laughs> so, Mike, tell, tell me about DJing. Where, what was your first gig? My first gig actually happened in Hamburg, um, which was the, the city that I used to visit as a kid very often because I was grow, uh, born close to Hamburg. And um, back then, in 92, I was already a producer for records, I had to release records and uh, had been playing live acts with all my gear on stage but um, also had turntables in the studio and um, I got I was offered a live uh, radio show that I um, even got money for to do it so I had some money as a poor student and I would buy vinyl records from those. I would receive some vinyl records already in my collection uh, because I was a journalist as well, but I wanted, of course, to buy those um, records that I really liked and wanted to present in my radio show. So, uh, once when I was in Hamburg, I went also shopping in that shop uh, at Container Records uh, on the Reeperbahn for records that you could maybe only get there because back in the days, certain record shops had certain vinyls and others had other vinyls so it was always great to be in a different city and buy vinyl because you wouldn't get those vinyls in Berlin maybe so coming out of that uh, record shop I ran into another DJ called Gary D who sadly deceased many years ago already um, some people may might, might know his records as base expansion on superstition records Actually, Superstition Records was also established to give a platform for people like from Hamburg, like Gary D. So um, I had this little plastic bag with records and uh, ran into him and he was asking me like, Mike, what are you doing in Hamburg? Yeah, I'm here. Are oh, you bought records? Show me those records. Oh, they suck cool. Oh, I want to get that one too. Well, you know, I'm playing tonight uh, at, at, around the corner at the unit club. Why don't you come and play for an hour too? And I was about to be nervous. I was about to be, to say like, oh, but I'm actually not a DJ, but I didn't. I said like, mm, why not? <laughs> so I went there. It's quite brave, actually. Yeah, it, I went there and did you know how to mix? So, sometime, yeah, I, I, I already had experience mixing in the studio, but sometimes you have to take that dive, you know. You do. And you somersault into a new situation and uh, learn to swim, and that's what I did at Unit Club in '92. Mm -hmm. And then word got around that I'm I'm also DJing, and people who didn't uh, wanted to book me as a live act would book me as a DJ. So like I played very early gigs at Trezor already in 1992 and 93 and I re became really fond being a DJ because, and that's the important thing for DJs and producers, um, as a producer um, I would, my records would sound very complicated, too complicated. And uh, I noticed myself only when I was also trying to mix my records and notice like oh, it's so hard to mix them because you know that's, that's too what much going I've on. noticed that with my own records that I've that, that changed like why did you put that note in the beginning because yeah. now I can't play it with a load of other records I have to cut out cut it out like a minute in whereas it, wh why were you trying to be so clever yeah <laughs> so I I, I I I'm clever myself <laughs> <laughs> to, no, we dumbed ourselves <laughs> up <laughs> uh, and to make sure that there's you know there's a proper intro beat there's a proper ending so you could really 
mixed stuff. I'm still not totally functional with my recordings. Mm. I still like to be too clever sometimes. Oh, but, uh, in the end, I learned my lesson at I'm being a DJ. I find, I find that the, the, with me is I get bored of my own listening to my own record, but to reproducing, you often listen to it all day, all night, all day. And I start getting bored. And though a record could have been finished the day ago, I start putting new things in to keep my own ears interested. Yeah. And that's one, uh, it's a fault of mine. Absolutely, don't do it. Yeah. Start a new track. Yeah, what was the, the expression? Kick, clap and hat and nothing more. This is the actual gear that you can see on the Marmion Schöneberg <laughs> Remixes covers on Decoy. Never a DJ. So where was your first studio? Our first studio was actually in Schöneberg, which is one reason why we called that track Schöneberg back then. <laughs> The original title was much, much longer. What was the original title? Ah, uh, well, it uh, original title on the first DAT recording was uh, Japanese boy having a great time <laughs> sailing from the troubled sea of ecstasy into the peaceful harbor of harmony or something. <laughs> because it's like it's like how we imagined that track, you know, like there's uh, that bumpy that, bass line. I've got to say, I've got to say, I do think Schoenberg is slightly better title than... Yeah, it's easier to, but, but also, for, unfortunately, for non-Germans, sometimes hard to pronounce. <laughs> but it's, it's the name of the, of the district, and uh, we also wanted to give a hymn to our district, because I had my studio in Schoenberg, Markus was living in Schoenberg, his girlfriend was living in Schoenberg, and like... All, everything, all the great first Asset House parties happened in Schöneberg, so uh, kind of uh, re related with a lot with that, this district that we are in right now. Never a DJ. What was your first re re actual record that you made yourself? First one that came out on vinyl, should you say? That was uh, my first Loop Zone 12 inch, which was released on Low Spirit, which is the label uh, which was run by the now late William Rutger and uh, Westbam. It was one of the first um, German electronic music labels. Uh, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't consider everything techno they did, but um, my first single probably was very techno. <laughs> <laughs> However, it was, it was also a sample fest, I must say, well, because I, I was so fascinated with sampling, I wanted, I, I created a tune which just consisted out of so many sources of sampling that it's uh, you can't really dance to it. It's just more <laughs> like like a collage of sound. I don't think people realize from your younger generation how exciting sampling was. Oh, it was the you know suddenly you could just uh, freeze the sound and use it and play it chromatically and jack with it like ba 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 ba. Also from a standpoint of of uh, art it was uh, the um, continuation of using sound in a collage and um, making it organizing noise to make music with it and I, I always found it so fascinating because with uh, that kind of organized noise you couldn't really put that in a score you know mm -hmm. you couldn't play notes with that uh, because any note would sound different because of the sound you would be triggering. And I found it totally fascinating. And it was expensive. I, I mean, so sampling time, I don't think people remember, <laughs> but the early samplers, you had about like seven seconds in mono. Oh, that was big, that was long. <laughs> and, and, and to get longer sampling time cost a fortune. My first sampler had like uh, four seconds uh, that were separated on several several units yeah. and um and but then the, the first proper sampler me and my studio partner hannes would buy was the yamaha gx 16w which sported like 30 second sampling oh, time my first uh, sampler was a uh, emax 2 
Oh yeah, we, we legendary was, tune. Emacs two, sixteen bit. So it's yeah. it was uh, had this real crunchy crunch. Yeah, I think yeah. I had twenty two seconds in mono or twelve seconds, glorious, something like that. Twelve seconds in in full stereo. But to be honest, that that was all you needed. To, it, to, to do a tune. But I think it made the records better because you had to be so frugal with your sample times. You didn't Absolutely. just put in crap you didn't need. And now, you know, what, 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 you know, I can do eight hours of sampling time. You know, <laughs> I'll I, I tell you about one moment that made me, you know, when, when the penny dropped in my brain, uh, because I, I listened to a lot of, you know, breakbeat tunes back then and I liked them and I thought like, Oh man, how are they programming these great drum drum grooves? And then I read uh, at, in Melody Maker magazine, I read a column by Mixmaster Morris. How oh, are you? Used to be signed to the same label as him, where, Rising High. Where he uh, where he explains like, so when you want to have your sample uh, squeeze more sample time into your sampler, you should sample a 33 record on 45 and then pitch <laughs> it down, and then you can loop it. And I was like. What the fuck does he mean? <laughs> Until I realized you just sample a bar and trigger it from your from, sequencer. Yeah, from an it down, down or it up. up. I was like, oh my god, it was like a revelation. Uh, because I had no clue before. Right? <laughs> so yeah, but this, those were the days as well where you don't didn't have YouTube. You didn't have a, you couldn't watch tutorials on YouTube and uh, I, I, wonder, how I was these having things. this conversation with friends of mine about motorbikes, just but it's the same principle. Is how I'm trying to remember how we learned. I mean, a lot of the time, talking, uh, yeah, sharing, uh, uh, sharing, sharing uh, knowledge. Yeah, well, I, suppose, I mean, I think well, what it was was I think I just remember watching people in studios. I don't remember actually, I never went to a course, I never. You know, no one actually sat down and said, this is how you use the, the work Trevor sequence I was yeah, using so at the moment. You tried by yourself. Yeah, you had to, you had to work it out yourself. And, and you would find... Oh, manuals. And Remember you, them? Yeah, sure. And you would, then you would find something that works and you would think like, oh, this is great. And you would stumble over things yeah. by just uh, learning the machine. And uh, you would come up with sounds that, that are when new because nobody yet used them like that. This is also something that doesn't happen right now anymore that uh, you just page, um, by, by accident discover a new sound because it seems like all sounds or grooves have already been used. But that's what we also thought before sampling. Like that. Yeah. I, lo I love sometimes you can get some mistakes can make amazing things Absolutely. happen. Some of my best best sounds have been complete mistakes. Yeah. You know, sitting on the keyboard by mistake and things like that. Like uh, for example, you know, when, 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 you, when you have a hi-hat pattern in Cubase and accidentally pull it down on the on the track with a bass sound and yeah. suddenly you have that bass sequence <laughs> 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 well, that happy accident you, would, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have uh, thought about that Doing it like this. which way are we going? this way? Run down. <laughs> never a DJ